chapter two is the architectural overview of the TCPIP protocol suite. In this chapter, we're going to look at how the different components that comprise the protocol suite actually communicate with each other and also over the network backbone. The overview of this chapter, we're going to look at the Microsoft TCPIP protocol suite, once again determining or taking a look at how the different components of TCPIP actually communicate and exactly what they do for us. We're going to take a look at the network interface technologies. We're going to verify or we're going to take a look at how TCPIP actually communicates with the OSI model, how we actually communicate by sending and receiving information over the network backbone or the physical medium, the cable, inside of a building. We're also going to take a look at the Address Resolution Protocol or ARP. ARP allows the mapping of a MAC address, the Media Access Control or hardware address which is hard coded or stamped into every network interface card, router, any component that actually communicates on a network that obtains a TCP IP address also uses the MAC address. The TCP IP address is bound or mapped to the MAC address, which is the hardware address. We'll also take a more in-depth look at the Internet Control Message Protocol, ICMP, which reports, this is the portion of TCP IP which reports errors back to a host whenever we try to send or receive information. For instance, if you've ever been surfing the internet, tried to access a website, and received an error message such as site unreachable, host not found, and so on, these are the error messages that are reported back to us through ICMP. The Internet Group Management Protocol, or IGMP, allows us to communicate with a large number of hosts at one time. Applications such as NetMeeting, make use of IGMP, multicast communications. We're communicating with a large number of host computers at one time, not with a single machine. We'll also take a look at the internet protocol, IP. Remember that TCP IP is the whole suite comprised. IP is a portion of TCP IP. We'll also take a look at ports and sockets, the transmission control protocol, or TCP, and also user datagram protocol or UDP. In this slide we're looking at the Microsoft TCP IP protocol suite and where each component actually lies in the network communication. Notice at the bottom of the network stack or the protocol stack we see the network layer. The network layer is the physical layer. This is where we actually put information on and off of the network backbone or the physical medium responsible for putting frames on and off of the network wire. The internet layer encapsulates packets. It encapsulates or takes for instance my Microsoft Word document, wraps it up inside of TCP IP which is encapsulation, and then passes it down to the network layer once again for communication over the network medium. Encapsulation can be thought of whenever it's cold outside and we take a coat to encapsulate our heat. Once I put on a coat, I have one layer of encapsulation. We can also further encapsulate ourselves, possibly by putting, over, putting on an overcoat. The transport layer is where we actually have communication between two or more hosts on the network. This is where our information is physically sent from one machine to another. The top layer, or the application layer, is where the application actually resides. Microsoft Word, Microsoft Outlook, for instance. Inside of Microsoft Outlook, whenever I choose File New, create an email message, put in an address to be sent to, and then I click Send, this is the application layer. Notice that email would go from the application layer, or Microsoft Outlook, down to the transport layer where the information is actually sent between two computers from my machine to the target computer. The internet layer would take that email message and encapsulate it inside of TCP IP or wrap it up for communication. The network layer is where that email, now being encapsulated, 
would be sent over the physical medium to the target computer, whether it's inside of our organization or outside, possibly across the world. As discussed in the previous video, ARP, or the Address Resolution Protocol, is responsible for the successful mapping of an IP address to a MAC address or a hardware address. Address resolution remembers the function of ARP. This is where the IP address is actually translated or mapped down to the hardware level once again or the MAC address. Remember that ARP uses a local broadcast to obtain a hardware address. Whenever my machine, whenever I try to establish communication with another computer, whether it be local or remote to my organization or domain, my machine first of all checks its local ARP cache. All the information or all the computers that I've tried to access should have an entry inside of ARP cache in the memory of my machine. If I have not accessed this machine, my computer will first of all look inside of its own ARP cache see if we have a mapping of the IP address to a MAC address. If one is not found, then I send out a local ARP broadcast to my network. If a host does not respond within a timely fashion, relaying the information or answering that their IP address is mapped to the appropriate MAC address that I want to establish communication, at that point we then communicate with the router, which we'll discuss in future slides. Remember that address mappings are stored in cache for future reference. Now this information is volatile. Once I shut down the computer, reboot the next morning or later in the day, for instance, all of these entries are gone. We can create static entries, which is discussed in the book. To resolve a local IP address once again, step number one, if I'm trying to communicate between computer one and computer two, Notice that my local IP address is 131.107.7.28 and we also see the hardware or MAC address listed. The first portion is 08004 which is a hexadecimal value. When trying to communicate with the machine IP address of 131.107.7.29, my machine would first of all look inside of its local ARP cache to try and obtain the MAC address of the machine in question that, or the target computer that we wish to speak with. After parsing the local ARP cache or after looking through all of the ARP entries and verifying that the entry is not in place, I would then send out a message or an ARP broadcast over the physical medium inside of our organization. All of the machines in my local domain or in my local segment would receive the ARP broadcast, open up the packet, and determine whether or not their MAC address matched the IP address. Once the target computer receives the ARP broadcast and we have successful mapping of an IP address to a MAC or a hardware address, at that time the target computer would reply back to my machine and communication is established. Now this is, once again, this slide discusses the local communication of an ARP broadcast. In the next slide, we're looking at resolving a remote broadcast. The same process takes place. Computer A, for instance, first of all parses or looks at its local ARP table. Once an entry is not found, I still send out a local broadcast. But since this information or the target computer is remote from my domain, a local host would not respond. Once I do not receive a response from my local host, the information or the ARP broadcast is sent to my default gateway, which in this case is 131.107.3.1. This is the router local to me. And we're looking at the near side of the router, which has been assigned the IP address of my default gateway. The router is smart enough or the router is intelligent. It would then check its ARP entries and search for a mapping of a MAC address to an IP address. Once the correct entry is found, the router would then send or forward the packet onto the target computer's local domain. All of the machines on the local domain 
would then open up the packet until the target computer has verified that the IP address and MAC address in question is its own. It then sends an ARP response back through the router to my machine and at that time successful communication is established. The ARP cache entries look very similar to what we see on the screen. This is a tab format entry. We first of all see in the first column, notice we see the IP address, tab for instance, and a MAC address. Once the local machine parses its local ARP cache table and the information is not found or the successful mapping of an IP to a MAC address is not found, the information is sent to the local network. If the information or the target computer's MAC address is not local to our domain, then the information is broadcast to the router once again. The router should be able to establish successful paths or a gateway to the remote machine. The ARP packet structure is discussed on page 17 of our course book. We're not going to spend time going through what each bit designates in the ARP packet structure. Notice that, for instance, the hardware type is listed in the ARP packet structure what type of network card we're using and so on. The hardware address length is also communicated in hexadecimal value. The sender's hardware or MAC address, sender's IP address, the target's hardware address, and also the target's IP address. ICMP, remember, reports back errors. This is the error communication protocol or the Internet Control Message Protocol, responsible for reporting errors back to us. Notice that each one of the boxes we see listed as one bit for a possibility of 16 bits total. We see once again that we have a type listed, what type of error message that we're receiving, also a code and a checksum value. Checksum is for packet integrity, as discussed in the video. IGMP, or the Internet Group Management Protocol, is responsible for multicasting or communicating with a large number of hosts at one time with applications such as NetMeeting instead of an individual target machine. Notice once again we have a checksum value, a group address, which is a network ID to be able to communicate with a large number of hosts at one time. Also we see the version, type, how much information was unused or how many unused bits were representing. The internet protocol, here is IP out of TCP IP, addresses and routes packets. This is the portion of the TCP IP packet that actually includes the senders and the target computer's IP address, also MAC address. It is connectionless. Remember that no session is established in communicating with IP. The information is simply broadcast or blast out on the network backbone. The target computer may or may not receive this information. So we have non-guaranteed best effort delivery. Reliability is a responsibility of the higher layer protocols and applications. Microsoft Word, for instance, if I choose File, Send To, select a computer name, with only IP in place, the information would be blast out on the network backbone or sent out on the network backbone with no guarantee that the target computer was even turned on at that time. If I'm trying to communicate a 4 meg file between two computers, due to network congestion, the whole 4 megs may not be able to be sent at one time. We may have to fragment or break the 4 megs up into smaller chunks, possibly 10 packets. These 10 packets, once the target computer receives or successfully receives all 10 packets, the information must be restructured in order, packets 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 10 for the successful use of the information. The information must be recompiled once the target computer receives it in the correct order to be usable. IP on the router also decrements the time to live. Remember that the time to live value, as we saw in the video, is the length of time that has been assigned to the information so it's not left circulating through the network medium indefinitely. 
using up bandwidth, creating traffic, and so on. The time to live value can be anywhere from three up to 60 seconds. It's whatever we set this value to be. IP also, at the router level, fragments large packets into smaller packets. So once again, if we're communicating 10 megs of information over the network medium, if the router senses too much network congestion or not enough bandwidth is in place, at that time it will break down the information into smaller pieces and send them to the target computer. Remember that our packets include information such as how many packets in all, what number packets such as 2 of 20, 3 of 20, 4 of 20, and so on. IP on the router also creates a new header for each new packet including a flag, fragment ID, and a fragment offset. We also calculate a new checksum value for packet integrity. IP also obtains the hardware address of the next router. If I'm having to communicate through several routers to com for successful communication to a remote computer, IP on the router actually communicates with the next router obtains the MAC address of that router before sending the information on, and it then forwards the packet to the next router in succession. The IP packet structure is discussed on page 22 in our manual. Notice that we include information such as the total length, the total length of the information that we're communicating. Also, the time to live value protocol being used to communicate the information the source address, destination address. Notice that each one of our boxes that we see listed is one bit, up to a 32-bit possible combination. TCP, the Transmission Control Protocol, is connection-oriented. My machine would first, of, would first of all, my machine being computer A, would first of all verify that computer B was available for communication, for the transmission or the receival of information. Session is established before exchanging data. So for instance, hey computer B, are you awake on the network? Computer B would then reply to computer A, yes I'm here, send me what you have. Reliable delivery. We have sequence numbers. In other words, if our information has been packetized or broken down into smaller chunks, sequence number allow the successful recompilation of the information at the target computer. So if I'm sending 10 packets of information, 1 of 10, 2 of 10, 3 of 10 would be established or re-established for the successful compilation and execution of the data, whatever it may be. It is also responsible for acknowledgments. As each packet is received, an acknowledgment is sent back to the sending computer from the target computer, stating receive packet one, receive packet two, packet three. If any of the packets has been dropped during the communication, this allows for more efficient recommunication of only the dropped packets. So in other words, if I've dropped packets six, seven, and eight out of a 10 packet communication, the target computer would respond through failed acknowledgments back to the sending computer, please resend please resend packets seven, eight, and nine. Also responsible for byte stream communications. Byte stream communications are real-time data, Microsoft NetMeeting once again. And we're also using port numbers as endpoints to communicate as we saw in the video. Port numbers on the routers, the physical connections on the router itself. TCP once again has guaranteed communication through the TCP IP three-way handshake. We see that this happens at the transport layer of the OSI model. Computer A would first of all try and communicate or verify that computer B was up and operational on the network. At that time, once computer B successfully replies to computer A that it is ready to receive information, at that time, the data is sent either as one large chunk of information or it may be packetized due to network congestion. And as each packet of information is received at the target computer, the target computer then sends data acknowledgments of successful or failed transmission of the byte of information. Then we see a successful acknowledgment and the session is 
broken at that time. The TCP packet structure is discussed on page 23 of our textbook. Notice that we see information included such as the TCP source port, where the information originated, also the destination port. We also see our sequence numbers, packet 1, packet 2, packet 3, and so on. The data length, how much data I am sending, the checksum value, and also the urgent pointer, as we discussed in the video. UDP. UDP is used for communication. UDP, the user datagram protocol, is used for communicating small amounts of information. Our routers, for instance, communicate UDP packets to verify that the next router in succession is available. UDP is connectionless. No session is established. We do not verify that the target computer or the target router is up and running before sending communications over the network backbone. We do not guarantee delivery due to the fact this is a connectionless protocol. No sequence numbers are communicated and no acknowledgments were transmitted or received. Reliability is a responsibility of the application, whether this be SQL Server, Microsoft Word, Microsoft Outlook, whatever application is sending the information is responsible verifying the proper communication. We're also using port numbers on the router once again as endpoints to communicate. In review, we've discussed the different components that comprise the Microsoft TCP IP protocol suite. We've also discussed address resolution protocol, or ARP, which is the hardware address. Remember that this address is a hexadecimal value assigned to any network component on the network infrastructure, such as a network interface card or NIC, a router, a printer, whatever it may be. Also, we've discussed Internet Control Message Protocol, which is responsible for reporting errors back to the sending computer in a transmission process. We've also discussed the Internet Group Management Protocol, which is responsible for multicasting or communicating with a large number of hosts at one time instead of an individual machine. We've discussed IP, or the Internet Protocol, which is connectionless, non-guaranteed communication. Whenever I'm communicating only with the IP protocol, I'm simply packetizing my information and throwing it out on the network backbone. With IP, the Internet Protocol, we have non-guaranteed delivery. I'm simply throwing the information out the target computer, computer may or may not receive it. The transmission control protocol, or TCP, is guaranteed delivery. We first of all verify that the target computer is operational and ready to receive information before any transmission of data takes place. UDP, the user datagram protocol, is responsible for communicating small amounts of information. Once again, router communication makes use of UDP. UDP, once again, is non-guaranteed. No session is established before the transmission of any communication.